Well, hello everybody, and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Where Do Native Plants Come From? with Mike Leahy. My name is Brooke Widmar. I'm the Director of Administrative Operations and Member Engagement for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today for this webinar. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, Carol will come out and read those to Mike. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. A link to that and any resources mentioned during the presentation uh, during the presentation today will be emailed to you tomorrow. Um, so to introduce today's speaker, Mike Leahy is a natural community ecologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. He's the author of Discover Missouri Natural Areas, a guide to 50 great places, now in its second edition. And he serves as a technical advisor for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. So with two degrees in forestry and over 25 years of working with various state agencies in conservation and natural resources, he is the perfect person to be teaching all of us about the natural history of native plants. So without further ado, take it away, Mike. Okay, thanks, Brooke. And thanks to all the uh, native plant enthusiasts out there on this uh, rather windy and warm December afternoon. So today we're going to talk about where do our native plants come from. So we use and see native plants in a variety of um, different landscapes, such as this uh, <clears throat> planting in a park in Kansas City. And I think all of us who appreciate um, working with native plants and landscaping uh, wonder about the native habitats that these, these plants come from. And understanding about the, the habitats and kind of the the history and natural history of, of our state and where these plants come from uh, really helps uh, us to become better gardeners and naturalists. So we'll be answering the question of where do our native plants come from? And of course, they come from our remnant natural habitats and the seeds that we use in native landscaping are collected from these remnant natural habitats, such as the um, really uh, amazing Houghton Prairie National Area shown here, which is in northwestern Missouri. And these include many different popular uh, plants for native landscaping. In fact, most of the uh, uh, wildflowers that we're going to be showing today um, during our discussions are um, from the top uh, best sellers from the Grow Native uh, tag sales. So these include things that are very familiar to uh, native landscapers, including things like butterfly milkweed, compass plant, pale purple coneflower, Ohio spiderwort, prairie blazing star, wild quinine, and lead plant. And these remnant natural communities that we'll be discussing today, like this prairie um, in Northern Missouri, are extremely rich in native species. So for an example, a 40 acre remnant prairie in Missouri can be host to over 200 different native plant species. And even at a finer scale, um, our native prairies are extremely diverse in native plant species. So in the area of about uh, a quarter square meter, which is about the size of the seat that you might be sitting on, um, botanists have found over 30 different native plant species uh, crammed into that small space. So we're going to be talking about our natural communities as sources of our native plants. And natural communities is a uh, more technical term for different habitats. We have a great reference here in Missouri, the Terrestrial Natural Communities of Missouri book, which really goes into detail um, about these different natural communities. And this book is available from the uh, Missouri State Parks online bookstore. And in it, they define natural communities as distinct groups of native plants, animals, and microorganisms that occur in different places 
on the landscape and through time. And so our natural communities are, are places on the landscape that have similar soils and environmental conditions that support different suites of native plants and animals. And so they occur across the landscape and we're able to kind of classify this great diversity of, of native plants we have in Missouri's landscape by using the concept of natural community classification. And it helps to take a, a kind of a broad geographical view of where we are um, on the planet and then in the country to think about the natural history of our different plant species. So here in Missouri, we are um, basically on the, the very eastern edge of the Great Plains and the western edge of the eastern deciduous forest. So to our west, um, the climate gets increasingly drier and to our east, it gets increasingly wetter. And so we're kind of in a transition zone and that influences the, the ecology of many of our native plant species. So understanding the context of our native plants in terms of their geography and their ecological and evolutionary history is, is really important. So here in Missouri, we are um, part of four broad ecological regions that cross state lines. And of course, the political boundaries of states are much different than the ecological boundaries. So we have the central dissected till plain section, which is here in North Missouri, or the glaciated plains region. Then the Osage plains region, which is here and, and stretches into Kansas, the Ozark Highlands of Missouri and Arkansas, and then the Mississippi Alluvial Basin section, which goes all the way down to uh, the Gulf of Mexico. And so understanding these ecological regions and then the plants that occur in them really um, helps us to become better native plant gardeners and enthusiasts. So as no surprise, certain plant species are restricted or characteristic to these different ecological regions of the state. So exam an example would be Pennsylvania sedge in North Missouri, the willow leaf sunflower in the Osage Plains, yellow coneflower, which is restricted to the Ozarks, or white milkweed, which is restricted to the boot heel or Mississippi alluvial basin section. I'll take a quick tour of these different ecological regions of the state, and then we'll dive into the nitty gritty of um, natural communities and give examples of each and different native plants that we use a lot in native landscaping um, that come from these different communities. So starting with North Missouri, um, this is a shot of Pawnee Prairie Natural Area and is representative of kind of the, the native landscape of, of North Missouri. Most of North, North Missouri was um, covered by glaciers a long time ago, 500,000 years ago, which left glacial till deposits over bedrock. And then on top of that, um, LUSS, spelled O-L-E-S-S-S, -S -S, sometimes pronounced loose, um, is soil particles of silt and sand that blew in after the glaciers receded when there were these big mud flats um, to the north and west of us. And that fine, sediment was deposited across our state, but really in very deep deposits in Northwest and um, Northern Missouri. And then this soil uh, formed the, uh, the soil that um, of course has become very productive today for agriculture in North Missouri. Um, but historically, most of North Missouri was a mix of, of prairies with some savannas and woodlands and wetlands. But today, of course, it's uh, very dominated by um, row crops as well as tall grass, uh, tall fescue pasture. The Osage Plains is another prairie region in the state. This one was not glaciated and extends um, from about Sedalia, Missouri west into Kansas uh, to the Flint Hills region of Kansas. These areas are um, underlaid by um, sandstone and shale soils and sometimes limestone soils that uh, developed from bedrock. And then there's a thin layer of that lust soil on top of these. So they're not as productive as the soils in North Missouri, but still 
because of the uh, the prairie vegetation, they developed uh, soils that are, are fairly good for agriculture. This area was the uh, the homeland of the Osage Native American tribe who lived in this part of uh, the world at least until 1808. The topography here is uh, pretty moderately rolling to flat, and like I said, it was mainly um, historically tall grass, prairie, savanna, and wetlands. Um, and today, of course, is uh, primarily an agricultural region. However, it also has some of the biggest tall grass prairie remnants left in the Midwestern US outside of the Flint Hills, because like in this picture here, many of these prairies were too uh, rocky and dry to, to plow. And so they were used as hay meadows and therefore uh, were conserved. And so cement, many of our prairies today, such as Golden Prairie <coughs> or Taborville Prairie um, are in this Osage Plains ecoregion. Next, we have the Ozark Highlands, which uh, is mainly here in Missouri and Arkansas. And this is, of course, is a very uh, interesting landscape with really um, dissected and very deeply, um, essentially very deep valleys um, that have been eroding for uh, millions of years. In the center of the Ozarks is Tomsock Mountain, which is our highest point in Missouri. And Tomsock Mountain, uh, is a volcanic rock and, and 1.5 billion years ago it would have looked a lot like uh, the Hawaiian island chains with these uh, volcanic out uh, islands occurring in a shallow sea around it. And so those volcanic rocks in the middle of the Ozarks are very old and then surrounded kind of like a, a layer cake around those are the, uh, the limestones and sandstones and dolomites um, that form the soils of the Ozarks. And then on top of that, there's a very thin layer of loss, but most of the Ozark soils are pretty rocky and dry outside of the floodplains. The Ozarks was a mixture of uh, forests and woodlands and savannas, but also some prairies. And we'll talk about the different uh, communities there. And it also had a significant pine component to it as well. The last uh, main ecoregion in Missouri is the Mississippi River alluvial basin or boot hill in southeast Missouri. It gets the most rain in our state, over 50 inches of rain, which is much different than say far northwest Missouri that can get under 40 inches of rain a year. This area historically was um, flooded periodically by the Mississippi as well as the uh, St. Francis and other uh, rivers. Um, but today is uh, essentially been transformed into an agricultural region um, dominated by row crops, but grow interesting row crops um, that uh, we and other crops that we typically don't get in the rest of the state, such as cotton and rice. But historically, this area was a, a mosaic of bottomland forests, swamps, and marshes, but also sand ridges around the towns of Kennett and Sykeston were these large sand ridges that supported sand prairies and savannas. And some of those still remain today. So this map shows the extent of the different glaciers that influenced Missouri. In the light blue, you can see that the really old glacier, the glacier that happened 500,000 years ago covered North Missouri and uh, northeastern Kansas. But the more, most recent glacier to be in North America was the Wisconsin Glacier. And that receded about 10,000 years ago, but it got all the way down to Des Moines, Iowa. And these glaciers had a, uh, a large influence on our native vegetation at the time. So back 12,000 years ago, Missouri looked more like Northern Minnesota today with spruce fir forests. The climate was cold, damp. At that time, there still were things like mastodons uh, roaming our state. Um, so a very different environment than today. But we have, still have some affinities of native plants that have more northern, uh, more northern distributions. Then from about 12,000 to 8,500 years ago, uh, the climate shifted and we started to get more oak and hickory woodlands and forests 
And at this time, Native American cultures um, were certainly in the state and were mainly nomadic with short-term settlements. Then from 8,500 to 4,500 years ago, there was a, a very important geologic phenomenon in the Midwest called the hypsothermal, where the climate got hotter and drier uh, for quite a long period. And during that time period, uh, the combination of that drier climate, um, along with uh, burning by Native American cultures for a variety of reasons, uh, allowed the tall grass prairie to move eastward um, from Kansas into Missouri, and then actually as far east as Ohio. Then the climate shifted again, and from 4,500 to 1,000 years ago, um, the climate became such that um, in the absence of fire, our uh, prairies um, basically would grow up into trees. And so the combination of Native American burning, periodic droughts um, maintained our prairies. At the same time, a shortleaf pine entered the state from the south. At this time period, certain Native American cultures became sedentary, sedentary um, with agricultural sediments and started using domestic plants, as well as, of course, um, continuing to hunt and gather. From about 1,000 to 400 years ago, um, <clears throat> the vegetation of our state started to take on the appearance of what we see today. This is a painting of uh, Lus Hill Prairies in Northwest Missouri on fire um, that uh, George Caitlin uh, painted in 1832. And then for the last 400 years uh, up to today, the vegetation becomes more familiar. And of course, within the last 200 years, um, the vegetation has changed dramatically in our state with the, uh, the advent of widespread agriculture and industrial development. But it's important to note that in 1800, this map here shows a rendition of, of the native vegetation of the state at that time. And the yellows are historically what would have been uh, tall grass prairie. You can see that um, there was quite a bit of prairie in the state and quite a bit of prairie in the St. Louis region, these larger prairies over here. The lighter greens and the very light green are forests and woodlands. And so prairie made up about a third of the state in 1800. Forests, oh, I, I take that back. The lighter green is savanna, and then this green color here is woodland. So savanna and woodland made up about 40% of the state. And then forest, which is the dark green, um, made up about, in combination with wetlands, which is blue, made up about 30% of the state. So that was kind of the context, real broad brushstrokes of our vegetation um, historically. And of course it's changed today, but we'll talk about these, these different ecological communities, starting with how do we classify our different native vegetation types? So, Regional climate patterns are, are of course really important. Like I said earlier, um, there's a really big climate gradient in Missouri between Northwest Missouri, which is much colder and drier than the Boot Hill, which is much warmer and uh, <clears throat> wet. Then we need to look at the lay of the land, the different types of landforms in the state, whether you're on a hill slope that faces North or South, how steep the slope is, these all influence the vegetation. The soils are extremely important. So are the soils deep and loamy or are they very shallow and rocky? Um, are the soils um, saturated by water or flooded for part of the growing season? How deep is the rooting zone? Are the soils acidic or more alkaline? It, what is the texture of the soil, whether it's loamy or clay or sandy. These all have a huge influence on what native plants grow where. The bedrock geology is also very important, especially in the Ozarks. So if you're on limestone or dolomite, these are rocks that are calcareous. And so they have a more neutral pH versus the sandstones, the cherts, and the uh, volcanic materials, which are acidic. So that can have a big influence on what plants grow where. And then hydrology, how water moves across the surface 
um, well, to dictate whether you're in an upland or a bottomland, and which plant species are going to be growing in those native habitats. We also look at vegetation structure. So whether the, the structure of the vegetation is mainly dominated by trees, shrubs, a combination of these, or more herbaceous. And one of the more important things with our natural communities are the presence of habitat specialists versus generalists. So things like common ragweed, white-tailed deer, Canada goose, we can find these in towns and cities as well as in uh, more wild areas. But these habitat specialists down here are what are really, um, basically really define our natural community. So things like yellow lady, slipper orchid, regal fritillary, the northern crawfish frog, and the rattlesnake boar moth, these are all species that you don't find um, typically in more disturbed human dominated landscapes. And they have a very uh, intricate life cycles. So the lady slipper orchid, of course, has uh, mycorrhizal fungal associates that help it uh, flourish. The regal fritillary butterfly here um, as a, a, a caterpillar feeds only on three different violet species in Missouri. The northern crawfish frog depends on the grassland crayfish burrows for its uh, habitat. And the rattlesnake borer moth uh, depends on rail snake borer plants uh, for its larval food source. So these habitat specialists are what really help define natural communities from um, disturbed communities, you know, such as an old field or a very degraded woodlot. And soils are extremely important. So in this graph, we, we see the total amount of microbial biomass that was measured in Tucker Prairie, which is a remnant unplowed prairie, a planted prairie that's 20 years old on the same soil type as Tucker Prairie, and then a uh, corn soybean rotation crop field, again, in the same soil type as Tucker Prairie. And we see that the, uh, the remnant has four times the amount of microbial biomass as the crop field, and even twice that of the 20-year-old soil planting. So intact soils with all their uh, mainly unknown biota are uh, a real hallmark of our natural communities and help differentiate a natural community from an old field. And of course, nature is not static. So our natural communities are heavily shaped and influenced by different ecological processes, including fire, flooding, soil saturation, drought, wind throw and storm damage, and herbivory. And in Missouri, we have eight main natural community types. So we have forest, woodland, savanna, prairie, glades, wetlands, cliff and talus communities, and caves. We'll start with prairies. Since this is sponsored by the Prairie Foundation and Grow Native, we'll start with the prairie communities. And of course, these are areas that are dominated by grasses and wildflowers that have less than 10% tree, uh, tree cover. Um, the word prairie is a French term for meadow that was applied by some of the early explorers of, of European explorers of this region um, as early as the 1600s. And they're dominated by perennial plants. So most of the plant species out in a prairie are perennial species that are fairly long lived. Um, some prairie plant species individuals, I should say, uh, can live up to 50 years old. So this is not um, a system that, that is dominated by short-lived uh, plant species. There are many different uh, specialist species in our prairies, including uh, certain native bees, such as the blue sage bee uh, shown here that depends on blue sage. And there are probably new species of science still waiting to be found in our prairies. For example, this uh, uh, leaf feeding beetle or shown here um, feeds primarily on false dragon hood, uh, Physostegia angustifolia, and that was not known to science until 1979. 
mainly just because an entomologist happened to be looking uh, more closely at some of our prairies. Again, our prairies are the original uh, pollinator buffets, um, super important for a wide variety of pollinator species, including native bees, butterflies, and others, and are also home to a number of other uh, life forms, such as the plains box turtle. Prairies occur um, throughout the Midwest and down into the Southeast. And historically, like I said earlier, uh, Missouri had about a third of its state covered in prairie. And of course today, uh, less than 50,000 acres or less than 1% of that remains. Fires are the lifeblood of prairies in terms of maintaining the uh, herbaceous character of them. And in today's current climate without fire, um, the prairies quickly succeed to, to trees and shrubs. Haying and grazing can also be used to some degree, uh, in particular haying, to maintain the open nature, but fire is, uh, has a, a critical number of ecological functions um, that those two other management practices don't replicate. So many of our native uh, plant favorites that we use, such as prairie drop seed, little blue stem, butterfly milkweed, compass plant. Um, a lot of these plants that are really uh, commonly used in, in native landscaping um, are prairie plants and originate in, in remnant natural uh, prairie communities. Many of these plants are drought tolerant and have different uh, physiological adaptations to drought, such as the compass plant, which has uh, very leathery leaves with the very rough sandpapery hairs that help uh, reduce uh, evapotranspiration loss in the plant. Some of these are uh, extremely gorgeous, like royal catchfly. Others include even uh, shrubby plants, such as lead plant, wild bergamot, another uh, favorite of, of many insect species, pale purple coneflower, which is kind of the, the signature prairie plant, purple, pop, purple poppy mallow, which is hard to say, prairie blazing star, and then certain species uh, of our prairie plants have very more specific um, soil condition requirements. So for example, prairie dock, which is common on prairies in Illinois and in the glaciated regions of the prairie uh, peninsula, um, in Missouri typically doesn't grow on many of our prairies because our prairies don't have enough calcium in the soil. However, at some places like a 25 mile prairie, uh, the Shooty Prairie, um, and La Petite Gem Prairie that, that the Prairie Foundation owns, we do find prairie dock <clears throat> because these soils were developed on limestone. Whereas most of our prairies that are left in the state um, developed over sandstone or acidic soils. Other prairie plant species like to have more moisture and more meso conditions such as Sullivan's milkweed. And so you tend to find this on, on prairies that are not as dry. So, knowledge of the site conditions for these prairie plants is important when trying to uh, plan a prairie planting um, so that you can match the right soil conditions to the right species mix. Some plants that are not available uh, commercially have a much more restricted um, growing conditions and, and they, they are being grown in um, greenhouse uh, production for you know, certain specific restorations, but they're very difficult to propagate, things such as the grass pink orchid. Now kind of moving on to the other end of the spectrum, and then we'll cover the things in between, are the forests of our state. So in Missouri, ecologists kind of subdivide our wooded communities into forests, woodlands, and savannas. And that's kind of a gradient of uh, soil moisture, and then what was the historic fire regime as well as site conditions. So our, what we consider our true forests are either in uh, bottomland situations or on north and east facing slopes, areas that historically did not burn very often, if at all. Um, and these areas usually have more mesic species such as sugar maple, northern red oak, um, 
bitternut hickory and basswood. And they have a very uh, dense understory with the lots of shade uh, in the summertime. And so the, the plant species that live in our forests have to be adapted to the shade or adapted to take advantage of the time before the leaves come out. So we'll get things that do well in shade like pawpaw and maidenhair fern or lots of spring ephemeral wildflowers like celandine poppy that flower and set fruit and do most of their growth and photosynthesizing before the leaves on the trees come out. And we have lots of different insect plant associations um, in all of our natural communities. And, and an example for forests are zebra swallowtails, which is a caterpillar feed primarily on pawpaw. Another interesting aspect of our forests are how our, um, our, you know, our favorite spring ephemeral wildflowers like bloodroot or Dutchman's britches or trout lily, how do those uh, plant species get spread across the uh, forest floor? Well, the interesting thing is that these uh, wildflowers have little tasty treats on the ends of their seeds known as eleosomes. And you can see these ants are gathering up these seeds with these little tasty treats on them. Native ant species will gather the seeds of these wildflowers, bring them back to their nest, and then they'll eat the treat off and then discard the seed in their, uh, essentially the garbage dump in the, in the ant colony. And invariably, some of those seeds will germinate. And so the distribution that you see across the forest floor of, of some of these uh, spring ephemeral wildflowers <clears throat> is, uh, is based on this interaction with ant species. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Other favorite wildflowers to garden with include uh, Virginia bluebells, <coughs> and um, large bellwort. <coughs> I think I must swallow the mat. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> so, our drier woodlands. <coughs> <coughs> And drier sites, <clears throat> we get a mix of dry site oaks and hickories, such as post oak and chinkapin oak and blackjack oak and black oak, and things like black hickory, and the dry south and west facing aspects of the Ozarks, and rocky sites and south facing slopes. And in these areas, historically, <clears throat> um, fire was a component. And we know that fire was a component of these communities because the record of fires is actually seared into the trees themselves. So these are fire scars <clears throat> in an older oak tree that um, dendro ecologists at the University of Missouri, Rich Guyette and Mike Stambaugh have documented the, uh, the presence of, of periodic surface fires in many of our dry um, woodlands in the Ozarks. And that, <clears throat> that fire regime, along with the uh, drier soil conditions, allows for the development of these kind of open understory park-like woodlands, um, such as what we find at Hahatanka State Park. They tend to have a little less tree canopy cover than our forests, and they can range to pretty open stands with almost all the way down to 30% canopy cover. Again, they have an open understory the ground layer is dominated by a mix of grasses, sedges, and forbs, especially um, many native legumes and uh, things in the aster family. Unlike forests where trees can get, you know, way tall, you know, like over 100 feet, our woodlands are typically have more stunted trees, except for the pines. So the pines can get pretty tall in the woodlands, but the, the oaks and hickories tend to be less than 60 feet tall. And as I was saying earlier, we tend to get those dry side oaks like post oak. And oftentimes these woodlands intermingle with glades, the rocky dry openings on our southwest facing hillsides in the Ozark. So in this photo, in the middle here, you see a glade, but then you see these open oak woodlands um, on the periphery. In the southeast Ozarks, um, 
we historically had over a million acres of shortleaf pine woodlands. And um, <clears throat> these supported uh, a number of interesting species, including the red cockaded woodpecker up until 1945. However, they were extremely valuable for the timber industry. And so between 1890 and about 1920, most of the uh, old growth shortleaf pine woodlands in Missouri were liquidated by uh, out of state timber companies and then subject to intense wildfires, which uh, really reduced the amount of um, shortleaf pine woodlands we have in the state today. But a number of agencies and organizations are trying to restore that, including the Mark Twain National Forest. So some of our woodland plants are actually very common uh, native landscaping plants. They include things like purple coneflower, which is used uh, very, very commonly in the native plant industries. Other species include bee balm, lots of cool season grasses. So unlike the prairies, we tend to have these grasses such as bottle brush grass, which are cool season grasses. They do, uh, <clears throat> they uh, flower and fruit earlier than the uh, native warm season grasses. On acidic sites, we get dittany, which is a, a neat little mint species that's also a, a great former of frost flowers um, in the winter and fall. Lots of different asters. So we have things like spreading aster, uh, golden rods, including elm leaf golden rod, and some drier site sedges, such as oak sedge. And all of these are, are pretty easy to propagate and use in, in native plant plantings. Now, of course, our, our oak woodlands and forests are extremely important for uh, insects and then birds. And so recently, Doug Talamy has put out this book, The Nature of Oaks. And he has outlined, uh, you know, just how important oak species are for our uh, native insects and then the native birds that eat these insects. And here in Missouri, uh, acorns are extremely important for wild turkey as well as uh, white-tailed deer and um, blue jays. However, the oaks also, besides producing the acorns, um, are host to many different species of, of leaf feeding larvae, such as the, uh, the buck moth larvae shown here. And in fact, um, <clears throat> Robert Marquis and his students from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, documented over, uh, oh, what was it? I think it's 300 species. Let me double check that. Well, almost 300, 260 different leaf, leaf chewing insect species on just white oak alone in the Ozarks. And so those uh, leaf feeding insects um, provide food for both our migratory and resident songbirds, especially for the young. Glades are the natural uh, rock gardens are mini deserts of the Ozarks, and they are these exposed bedrock areas, usually on south and west facing slopes, um, typically very rocky with uh, <clears throat> the bedrock close to the surface. Around the town, or south, I should say south of the town of Ava, Missouri, there are some really tremendously large glades um, on the Mark Twain National Forest, and they, these are shown here, the, the largest glades in the state. Glades have many affinities to um, flora and fauna of uh, Oklahoma and Texas, so more of a southwestern uh, affinity. So we get things like tarantulas, eastern collared lizards, and then again we get um, a number of different uh, wildflowers, some which occur on prairies pretty commonly, like the pale purple coneflower, and the yellow coneflower, which is more of a glade plant, but occasionally will occur on prairies. We have a variety of different glade types and they kind of host a, a, each one hosts a unique kind of set of species. So we, we have limestone and dolomite glades, which are um, more alkaline or basic in pH. But then we have a number of acidic glades. So we have chert glades <coughs> and sandstone glades and rhyolite glades. And so they, they differ quite a bit in their plant species composition. <coughs> 
some of the glade plants that are uh, easy to garden with in rock gardens include uh, Lanceleaf Coreopsis, Missouri Evening Primrose, Missouri Black-Eyed Susan, and Aromatic Aster. And Aromatic Aster is a really neat aster because it is one of the last to bloom. And so it provides a, a, a source of, of nectar and pollen for uh, species very late into the season. <clears throat> and like many of the prairie plants, many of these glade plants have adaptations to deal with drought. Some glade plants just avoid drought entirely by uh, blooming very early in the spring and drying up quickly before it gets too hot and dry. Others uh, like fame flower or rock pink will store moisture in succulent leaves. Then others like Missouri Black Eyed Susan shown here have uh, extremely hairy leaf coverings um, that really reduce that evapotranspiration loss. Now, savannas are kind of in between prairies and woodlands. Some people call them prairies with trees. So in a savanna, in between the scattered oak trees, you'll find typical prairie plants. And then underneath, down in here, underneath the drip line in the shade of those oak trees, you'll find plants that typically grow in woodlands. So it's kind of a mix of species that occur in prairies and species that occur in woodlands. So you can have a high diversity the tree cover is scattered, so like less than 30% cover. We don't have many of uh, savannas left anymore in Missouri. <clears throat> They're pretty unique and pretty rare. Some of the best savannas left are in North Missouri, uh, like here at uh, Long Branch State Park or at Union Ridge Conservation Area. <clears throat> and like I was saying, you'll get out in the middle and the, in the open areas, you'll get prairie species like showy goldenrod. And then underneath the uh, the shade of the scattered trees, you'll get things like plenty of tick trefoil. Now we have a lot of savanna structure areas in Missouri. So we've got parks that look savanna-like, but they don't have the rich ground flora. We have a lot of fescue savannas where you've got scattered oak trees growing over fescue, but we have very few areas where you have that prairie vegetation with scattered trees on it. Now moving on to wetlands are wetter sites. Now wetlands can also include bottomland forests and bottomland prairies, <clears throat> as well as uh, more typical wetland types such as swamps shown here or marshes. Wetlands of course are areas that have um, either influenced by flooding or soil saturation or combination. And so wetland plants, um, you know, roots need to respire and wetland plants have to be adapted to having their roots be in soils that are sometimes an anoxic or lacking oxygen. So they have to have adaptations to deal with that. Marsh communities um, can be very variable depending on the water depth and the length of the flooding or inundation. So, you know, out in that open water, you're gonna get things like American lotus and uh, water lily. <clears throat> but then as you move closer to shore and you get sh more shallow water and less, uh, less inundation, you get things like uh, arrow, arrowhead or duck potato, and then you start picking up more of the emergent plants like river bulrush and things like swamp milkweed shown here, which is a, a great plant for, uh, for monarchs. They really, really go after it as a uh, as a caterpillar food source. And a swamp milkweed also is a uh, host plant for the cute little swamp milkweed leaf beetle. So it's, it's one of those plants that if you've got a rain garden or a, a moist area with sun to, to grow, it's, uh, it's a great plant for, uh, for insects. We have a wide variety of wetland types. So I, I mentioned bottomland forests, uh, bottomland prairies or marshes. Um, but then we have these unique groundwater seepage communities like Ozark Fens where the where cool groundwater percolates to the surface and creates a uh, <clears throat> kind of a cool microenvironment. Acidic seeps are similar. The difference between the seep and the fen is that the seep, the groundwater is acidic and in the fen, the groundwater is, cal is uh, calcareous. So this has a high pH and this has a low pH mentioned marshes earlier, and then we have bottomland forests as well. 
<clears throat> a lot of these plants can be grown in rain gardens or at the margin of ponds that grow in our marshes. And these include things like pickerel weed, cardinal flower, which is a, a great magnet for hummingbirds, a, a variety of sedges like the brown fox sedge, southern blue flag iris, one of our native irises, soft rush, and then of course bull rushes too. And then getting back to those fens, <clears throat> one of the species that's pretty typical of our Ozark fens is the orange coneflower, Rebecca fulgida. But the interesting thing about it is even though it is tolerant of growing on uh, wet saturated soils, it also does fairly well in, uh, in um, more, more, you know, just more medium um, well-drained soil, as long as the acidity is not too high. A shrub that's a wetland shrub that's great to uh, plant that also will do okay in just uh, moist, not moist, but just, you know, good soil, but not, not necessarily wet um, is buttonbush, which is very important for a number of pollinators. And then some of our wetland plants that grow in these uh, fens are considered glacial relics like Riddle's goldenrod. So it, it's a species, if, as you see here on the map, uh, in Missouri, it occurs in the Ozarks primarily, but most of its range is uh, much farther to the north of us. And so it is able to hang on in these fens that have a cooler, more moist microenvironment, even though it's, it's really more of a northern species. So to find out and to get, you know, on hands-on um, experiences with our native plants, their natural environments, I encourage everybody to um, get out and enjoy and explore some of our uh, dedicated Missouri natural areas, which um, are owned by a variety of different agencies and organizations, ranging from the Conservation Department and State Parks to the Forest Service to the Prairie Foundation. And you can learn about these by um, looking at our online Missouri natural areas directory or uh, purchasing a copy of Discover Missouri Natural Areas, which is a guidebook to natural areas that um, we sell at our nature centers and on our nature shop online. And the goal of the natural areas program is to conserve native plants and animals in their native environments uh, for future generations and for current generations. And the, the symbol of the uh, or the logo for the natural areas program is the jack in the pulpit shown here, which is drawn by uh, the wildlife illustrator, Charlie Schwartz originally. And of course, for information on uh, growing native plants, sources of native plants, um, please check out the uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation's Grow Native program. But remember that um, our native plant industry really depends and these native remnants uh, as a, a viable uh, source of seed that um, is drought resistant and uh, produces seed regularly throughout year in, year out. Um, <clears throat> so it, it really, our native plant industry is really tied to having these remnants as, as seed sources. And with that, um, I think I will go ahead and maybe Carol can help me with the chat. Yes, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, yeah, I will uh, field questions to you. We do have a few. Um, and thank you very much for incredible uh, overview. I think this is really helpful to put um, the native plants that we use in landscaping into their original context. And I wanted to mention to you, Mike, um, while you shared uh, the native environments of, of many popular landscaping plants, even though, for example, they might occur in one natural community, they might actually grow in a variety of habitats in your yard. For example, um, purple coneflower, we think of as, as a full sun plant in our yards generally, even though its native environment is kind of part shade. Could you speak a little bit about that kind of adaptability? Yeah. Yes, certainly. Yeah. So some species like purple coneflower are have a pretty wide range of light conditions. Um, whereas there's, you know, such as um, 
prairie dock or compass plant are not going to grow well in shade. <clears throat> it would be very stunted. So yeah, certain species have a, a broader range of, of site conditions than, than what we see maybe in their natural habitats. Um, I think that's that's what you're trying to get at, Carol. Yes, and, and also if, if anyone has any questions about um, native plants to use, in the Grow Native Native Plant database, um, if they do have some flexibility in their growing conditions, like the purple comb flower that Mike mentioned, that will be reflected um, in, in the database. And in the database, you can also sort the 300 plus plants that we have by native habitat. So if you wanna see a list of prairie plants or uh, blade plants, you can, you can sort the plants that way. Um, so we do have some questions. Um, so say you, so Shelly, she has a question. Will our home prairie plants be okay without burning? I live in the city and she's not sure if that's allowed. So can you talk about kind of the management of some of our planted, you know, prairie plantings or other plantings? Yeah, Where's well, we have, a, we have a prairie planting here in Jefferson City at, at our home. And um, unfortunately we can't use fire either. And so um, what we do is, we actually leave the uh, the standing <coughs> prairie plants, leave them standing until late in the spring so that insects that use the stems and such um, can overwinter in them. Then, of course, it's more labor intensive, but you have to remove all that dry, dead biomass by clipping and raking, essentially, and then we, we compost it um, to allow for the new growth to come out. So that's that's basically the same as, as haying a prairie. It, it provides some of the benefits uh, for those prairie plantings and they do okay. Um, it's just more labor intensive, really. You may not get the same germination rate. Um, you know, fire and, and smoke do actually create more germination for certain prairie species and more flowering, um, but it, it works. In, to just do to do it, remove that dead biomass manually. Thank you. Um, here's a kind of a general question: Why are the invasive plants we're facing, like bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, etc., um, they're from Asia? Is the Asian biosphere older, more mature, or you know why are they so aggressive compared to some of our native species? Yeah, so many of our really aggressive plant species are Asian. And, and the reason being is that the climate in parts of Japan and China um, are very similar to, to ours. And then geologically, um, there's a, a many similarities of the, the flora of China to the flora of North America, Eastern North America. So um, they have many similar ecological communities. Um, similar genera of tree species. <clears throat> and so when those plants, the thing that's different is they don't have the same insects and diseases. Um, we don't have the same as they do. So when those plants like bush honeysuckle or uh, still grass are introduced here, they, they run amok. Um, same thing with garlic mustard. And of course, that, in that case, that's a European um, invasive plant species that uh, comes from places in Germany and Poland that again have similar similar growing conditions to uh, to the Midwest and Eastern North America. Thank you. There's so many great questions here. Um, Louise asks, who has access to the seeds in the remnant prairies? And I might address that here real quickly, Mike, in terms of MPF prairies. Um, right. the, but do chime in. So the Missouri Prairie Foundation um, we, we do have um, contracts with seed, seed harvesters. So they're able to submit bids for collecting seed under um, uh, pretty strict um, protocols. So we wouldn't want any kind of um, machine harvest to be going on if the ground is really wet. So, cause we don't want to compact the soil and we have rules about what percentage of seeds can be collected. Um, so that's the case for our prairies, which are, we're a private organization, so they're privately owned, even though our, our prairies are open to the public. 
Um, and then I know that the conservation department where Mike works, they also have contracts with seed collectors and Mike can talk about that. But then just generally, I'll say that um, you would always want to um, ask permission before collecting seed anywhere and understand what the rules are. Um, but I'll let Mike address um, rules for the conservation department. I don't know what the rules are for, say, forest service or other public lands. Yeah, I know for the conservation department, um, if you're on a natural area, natural area, you're you're not supposed to collect uh, grains and seeds. Um, but on standard conservation areas, you can collect some for personal use. You know, like a a handful of seed would be considered about what you'd want to collect. We do do seed harvest with um, some commercial native seed produ uh, plant producers, but we do it on share so that some of the seed that is harvested and processed actually goes back to the conservation department. And then we use that on our own prairie reconstruction plantings. Um, so we do that as a way to get seed uh, to plant around remnant prairies that on, on previously cultivated lands. Thank you. Mark has a question. Where in Saline County was the marsh that you showed? Is it a salt marsh? It's not a salt marsh. It is actually, and it it's, <laughs> it was taken years ago. Um, it's part of the Teetsaw Lake area of Grand Pass Conservation Area. So it's kind of a remnant old oxbow that um, in wet years can be pretty neat with um, marsh vegetation. A great place to see a marsh though in, in Saline County is uh, Van Meter State Park, <clears throat> which has a natural area. Um, on it, which has a nice um, metal boardwalk that goes out into the marsh. It's a little bit easier to, to access. Um, and that's part of that same Teetsaw Lake complex. Thank you. Melanie asks, do we need to plant natives in our gardens that come from our specific area? For example, are we doing any harm by planting Ozark plants in the Osage Plains? Um, I, the only time I would be concerned about that is for very uh, rare restricted plant species, um, species of conservation concern that we're not, the people aren't planting right now anyway. So I wouldn't be concerned planting uh, pale purple cone flower that was collected in the Ozarks uh, in the Osage Plains. There, I, don't, I don't think that would be a big issue. And, and Mike, you mean like in somebody's yard? Right. Yeah, and yeah, you wouldn't want to use it for a like a native plant reconstruction, but for yard planting, the, the the chances of that causing a genetic issue are pretty slim. And Mike, maybe maybe a large prairie planting is would be fine, maybe. But do, do you mean maybe if you're doing a reconstruction next to a remnant, you might want to be careful. I mean, you could you could have a fescue field in a in a park that was a couple acres and do a prairie reconstruction but there wouldn't be any other remnant prairie around. So do you think that the seed provenance is as important there or do you still think you should use local seeds? I don't think they would be as important. I think the plantings that are next to remnants, you'd wanna keep it from the same eco region. Okay, thank you. Um, Betsy asks, um, I've gathered some seeds from my own small native flower bed. Is there a best time and method to plant them? Well, um, yeah, the best time to plant them would be to, well, to, to have some mineral soil and then to broadcast the seed essentially now in the winter time. <clears throat> and um, hopefully uh, we'll get some fro you know, fr frost heaving that'll work that, that seed, um, get great soil seed contact. Um, you might want to put a little bit of straw or leaves or other mulch on top of it, just a light amount so that the seed is not exposed there for birds to eat. But um, essentially winter time is, is the ideal time so that you get that natural incorporation of the seed and, your, and also get natural cold stratification for species that might need that. Thank you. And, and Brooke will send out a, a link to a recording of this webinar along with some um, other resources. And we do have quite a number of resources on 
prairie establishing prairie plantings and also on seed identification um, and uh, seed propagation. So we will um, get those links to you. And also uh, we have a really good article by our director of prairie management, Jared Hubner on um, site preparation and for prairie plantings and a recording, a recorded webinar that he did as well. So we'll send those links. And also we're going to have a really wonderful um, uh, program, virtual program next October from Mike Hoyle, who works for Missouri Wildflowers Nursery on seed collection and propagation. And the reason we won't have it until October is that Mike Hoyle needs some time over the spring and summer to take photographs and really document the process, but he's really a wealth of knowledge. So, um, so that'll be a really good program. Um, and so there are several questions I see here about um, converting fescue dominated property and um, how to help with prairie reconstructions. Those are pretty broad topics. So I would recommend looking at those resources that we have um, already because that will answer a lot of questions that you have. And you can also, um, when you're ready to purchase seed, um, you can uh, consult our Grow Native professional members who sell seed and they have a lot of really good information as well. For example, how many seeds um, per, you know, pounds of seeds per acre and so forth to, to seed. Um, there is another question from Greg, ask Mike, would you ever plant a native R? <coughs> oh, I'm still hacking away here. Um, I know it depends, I guess. I, I really don't know a lot about native R's. I would actually put that question back to you, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it depends on what your objectives are, um, what your purpose is for planting, but we, um, just had a webinar on the differences between native ours, which are cultivars of native plants, and um, we have a recording of that of that as well. And that might help you answer the question, um, Greg, about if if you would ever do that. Um, our, um, there's still a lot we don't know yet about the ecological benefits of native ours versus straight natives, but we do know that straight natives do provide many ecological benefits. And so the Grow Native program does um, promote using um, straight native species, but there's just a lot more to, 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 to still to learn about native ours. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure that we have any other questions. So thank you everyone very much for tuning in today. Thank you, Mike, for a really great webinar um, that really helps uh, us appreciate the wealth of native plants that we have and and how they how they developed and evolved here. So thanks very much everyone. This is our last webinar of 2021, but we will be back in January with um, we've got two more webinars in January and then more planned throughout 2022. So thanks again everyone and happy holidays. Thanks.